The book of Judges, everyone, chapter uh, 13. I'd like to read just a verse there and then we'll go back. Chapter 13, the book of Judges. It says, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. Forty years. A little background on this passage. I think many of us are familiar with it. When Joshua led the Jews into the promised land, Marty was talking about that this morning, you know, uh, not to be afraid and to be courageous. So I'm going to pick it up and move that forward a little bit. When Joshua led them into the promised land, they spent many years settling the land and overcoming the people who lived uh, in that land previous to their arrival. And during these times, they had good and bad periods. You know, during the good times, they were obedient to God, they enjoyed peace and prosperity, they built cities while expanding their influence and control over the countryside. During the bad times, um, they started to disobey God, they began to worship idols, and during these times, God would then send other nations to attack them, to destroy them as punishment for their sins. So when I say good times, bad times, I'm not only talking about harvests and things like that, but they, they kind of veered in and out of God's will. When they obeyed, things were going great. When they disobeyed, things would go poorly for them. So after suffering defeat many times, the people would see their mistakes, they'd repent, they'd ask God to save them from their enemies. And of course, in His kindness, God always heard these requests and He would send a person to lead or to rescue them from their attackers. These saviors, these rescuers were called judges. Now in the Old Testament, the book of Judges tells the stories of the, the men and women that God sent at different times in their history in order to save them from either invading nations or dangerous practices. So uh, Judges 13.1 kind of fits into that um, scenario. So in Judges 13.1, we have a situation where Israel had once again disobeyed God, and this time he allowed the Philistines to attack and control them for a period of 40 years. Isn't it interesting? One verse, you know, boom. You know, God allowed the Philistines to come in and control and attack them, make them miserable for 40 years. Think about that. Can you imagine Canada coming in and taking over the United States for 40 years, controlling everything, being a thorn in the flesh? It's a long time, 40 years. Not four months or four years. World War II, four years or the wars in the Middle East, you know, six years, eight years. We're talking about four decades, almost a lifetime uh, for some people. And so once again, God does this. He uses the Philistines to, uh, uh, to punish them. And of course, the people cried out for relief and God sent them one of the most dynamic and powerful men uh, to save them. He was the wonder child of that age but he was a wonder child that went bad. And so this is the story of Samson. Samson, the wonder child. Judges, chapter 13. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever met people who seem to have everything? I was watching a little bit of golf on, the, you know, on TV this afternoon, PGA, and I was thinking about Tiger Woods. You know, he became the, the very best golfer at the youngest age. Amazing the things that he, that he accomplished. He had everything, didn't he? He had skill, he had fame, he had success. He had everything that uh, many people want in this life. Or have you ever known children who could play you know, uh, classical music and play it well at the age of eight or, or nine? Or young people who are naturally gifted as athletes or scholars or artists? or wealthy and educated families able to give their children all the advantages, the best teachers, best schools, best programs, you know, they have everything. Well, Samson, he was one of these guys. He was a wonder child of his, of his era. First of all, he was chosen by God to be the leader of his people. Uh, let's keep reading, uh, we'll read out of chapter 13, most of my comments come from there. It says, there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had borne no children. 
Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth um, to a son. Uh, now therefore be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the, um, from the, hands of the Philistines. So we begin with Samson. He was chosen by God to be the leader of his people. So he begins with position. He already has it. You know, God could have chosen a person already eager for leadership, someone who had trained hard for battle, but instead he gives the leadership to a child not even born. Samson did nothing to earn or deserve the position of honor among his people. He was merely selected before he was born to become the leader of his nation. In that day, you know, to be a Nazarite meant that a person's life was dedicated to God for a special purpose. And, and, and the sign for this was that they would not cut or trim their hair, nor would they drink alcohol. Not only did he have position, everyone knew from an early age that he had this special position. What a gift from God. What an advantage this young man had. Other than that, he was given great gifts. If you read chapters 13, 14, 15, 16 in, in this book, uh, we don't have time to do that tonight, but you find out that God really blessed this young man. Along with his position, he was given tremendous talent. Like the prodigies of today, Samson became the wonder child of his day and age because of his strength. The writer of the book of Judges only gives us a few examples to give us an idea of his amazing strength and amazing courage. Uh, for example, in chapter uh, 14, we read that he kills a lion with his hands. Uh, in another chapter, chapter 14, a little later on, verse 19, that he fought and he killed 30 men single-handedly. Uh, in chapter 15, we read that he captured 300 foxes. Chapter 15, 15, that he killed 1,000 men in battle. And then, of course, near the end, we read about him destroying a temple by pushing the stone pillars that held it up, bringing tons of stone down. He was an amazing, amazing individual. Now, he didn't have talents developed by training and exercise. Nowhere here does it say he was working out at the gym and as a young guy he was lifting stone, pressing iron. You know, he didn't do anything to have that talent. It was merely given to him. He had a talent you couldn't have unless God gave it to you. So he had position and he had talent. And thirdly, he had opportunity. Chapter 15, if you don't mind flipping over to chapter 15, just want to read a quick passage there. 15 verse 20, it says, So he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. So Samson had opportunity. You know, some people have talent, but they never get a break to show the talent that they have. I mean, amateur theater and amateur sports is filled, they're filled with very talented people who were good enough to be professional, but they, they just never got a break. They never had the chance you know, to perform on a big stage or you know, they were never at the right moment, at the right place to be drafted into a, a professional team or whatever. A lot of people like that. But the Bible says that Samson was recognized as a judge, as a leader among his people for 20 years, two decades. So Samson had it all. He had position, he had power, and he had the privilege to demonstrate his power and his position. But unfortunately, Samson was, as I said, he was a wonder child that went bad. Now let me ask you another question. Why do people who seem to have it all so many times end up destroying themselves? To me, that's always, you know, I, I just shake my head when I listen to the news about someone who's famous or rich or talented or you know, they've got it all and by some foolish, stupid action throw away their entire, their entire lives. You know, why do famous movie stars kill themselves? Why do successful business people become alcoholics? Why do politicians who have position and power and prestige and all those things act so immorally and sometimes so foolishly. Can you imagine? 
not even trying to hide the foolish things that they do. They do it out in the open thinking they won't be, they won't be caught, people won't care. One of the things that really breaks my heart is why do children with the advantage of a Christian home and good education and proper example and encouragement, why do they throw it all away and do exactly the opposite of what they've been taught? Now there are, uh, those are some of the most difficult questions to answer. In Samson's case, the reason he went bad is that along with all of his advantages, he also had to deal with the same kind of things that ordinary people had to deal with. And he didn't do so good when it came to those things. For example, he had to deal with impulsive behavior. You see very early in his life, in chapters 14 and 15, uh, he tried to win a bet that some young men couldn't figure out one of his riddles. So they cheated him and he lost the bet, which led to a whole lot of trouble. He was young, he was strong, he felt he could do anything, so he didn't use judgment or wisdom to control his thoughts. He just did whatever came to his mind without thinking it through. Does that sound familiar? All of you who have raised teenagers here, does that sound familiar? The, the, the most asked question by parents to their children is the following. What were you thinking? What were you thinking? And the answer that comes back usually, I don't know. I wasn't thinking. Well, Samson had that problem. He was impulsive. If it came to his mind, he had to do it. There was no filter there. And so, is he the only one that had problem with impulse control? Absolutely not. That's an ordinary person's problem, isn't it? And he, he had a hard time dealing with that ordinary person's problem. Secondly, he had to deal with sexual lust. He was strong and he was the leader of his people, but he could not control his own sexual impulses. The writer tells us of two occasions where his lust got him into trouble. In chapter 14, we read about the time he desired a pagan woman and over the objection of his parents, doesn't that sound familiar? Over the objection of his parents who knew better, he just had to have her. This led to a conflict where he was then at war with the Philistines. And then in chapter 16, we read that he had sex with a prostitute, and if it wasn't for his great strength, he would have been killed by his enemies who were waiting to capture him, because they knew what his weakness was. His weakness was not in you know, being able to lift stuff or break things or kill things. His weakness was inside of him. He was weak when it came to sexual temptation. And so Samson was the strongest man of his time, but when it came to sexual temptation, he was weaker than even ordinary men. And then another problem that he had, he had to deal with his commitment to God. I mean, he started out like so many uh, begin uh, their, Christian, their Christian lives. He started out in the same way. He was raised in a godly home, he knew and was taught about God as a child. He was dedicated to God as a young boy and God blessed him. But as he grew up, his commitment to following God was challenged, especially by his weakness for sex with pagan women and controlling his impulses and his temper. And this came to a head when he met and fell in love with Delilah, a pagan woman who not only seduced him, but after being bribed by the Philistines, she talked him into breaking his commitment with God and revealing the secret of his strength. And the secret of his strength was that uh, a vow that he had before God to be dedicated to him and only him, and the sign of that vow was his long hair. Of course, we know that she cut his hair and he lost his strength and he was captured. And we know the familiar story, the Philistines, they gouged out his eyes and they used him as a human trophy at pagan festivals, and they put him to work like a horse pushing a grinding wheel in a prison mill. What, what, a, whoa, what a long fall down. The wonder child of the time was blind, humiliated, 
and enslaved by the very nation that God had originally chosen him to defeat. There's the irony of it. He had been chosen and given all this talent so he could be used by God to defeat this nation. And what happened? He ends up being a slave and an object of ridicule by this nation. He never did live up to his potential. He never did live up to the great hope that people had for him, that he would save Israel from the Philistines as God had chosen him to do. Now, the story doesn't end there, thankfully. It'd be pretty sad if there was a period after that and we left Samson in the prison, blind, helpless, humiliated. But there's a little more to the story. The ending isn't all bad. We read that while in prison, his hair began to grow back and along with it, Samson's faith in God. Let's go to chapter 16, shall we? Let's read verse, uh, let's see, beginning in verse 23. 23. Now the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, for they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. See, in those days, uh, when, you, when you defeated your enemy, it means your God was more powerful than their God. You know, that's what it was about. That's why they rejoiced. When the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has given our enemy into our hands, even the destroyer of our country, who has slain many of us. It so happened when they were in high spirits that they said, call for Samson, that he may amuse us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he entertained them. And they made him stand between the pillars. Then Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women were on the roof looking on while Samson was amusing them. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O God, that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and braced himself against them, the one with his right hand and the other with his left, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those he killed in, uh, in his life. Interesting way to end that story. Notice I want you to um, see that he didn't ask again for his position. He didn't say, could I go back to, the, can we have a restart, a reset? I can go back to being the leader of the people. I can go back to having you know, my position. He didn't ask for that. He didn't ask for his privileges. He asked only one more opportunity to serve God in destroying the Philistines as he was originally called to do. In other words, he's saying to God, please give me one more chance to do what you asked me to do from the very beginning. You see, Samson didn't succeed in completely doing God's will but he died calling on God's name and trying to accomplish some of what God had asked him to do. You know, what's really sad about this story is that if he had dealt with his problems, he could have kept his life and won a complete victory over his enemies. That's the part that really, oh wow, hurts me when I read about it. I don't know if any of us have strength like Samson, but I do know that many of us have been given great advantages and privileges and opportunities by God, especially, especially here in America. I mean, you know, we, we, we could go through all the problems that we have as a nation, you know, political problems, economic, there's a drought, too much rain here, not enough rain. You know, we could go through all of that, but really, if you went to almost any other country in the world and said to them, would you like to come to America? I'll, I'll give you a, a visa, you can come right away. I don't think a lot of people would turn it down. I don't think a lot of people would turn it down. We still live in the richest of the land. Yeah, you know, economy's tough, but believe it or not, it's a lot tougher in other places. We still live in a place where we can stand up freely in the middle of the square, town square, and declare our faith in Jesus Christ. We can still do that freely. We can still move from one place to another and not have to ask the government permission. You don't think about that. 
But when I was studying with some women in China and we were talking about you know, the differences between there and here, if they want to move from one place to one province to another, they have to get permission from the government to be able to do that. We don't think about that kind of control. If they want to have more than one child, they have to go get permission from the government and pay a kind of a, a fee to the government for, for the ability, for the permission to have a second child. I know that there's always corruption you know, in any nation, there's always corruption, but our, our nation isn't built on corruption. If a police officer stops you because you're going fast, you may not be happy in this nation, he'll give you a ticket for 100 bucks or 120 bucks, but you don't have to pay him personally. And that's not the way it works in a lot of other countries. And so we, we've been given tremendous blessings in this, in this nation. And so I think Samson's life teaches us a few important lessons as people with privileges. First of all, it teaches us that there are no advantages without challenge. No advantages without challenge. No matter how talented, how many advantages or opportunities you have, you have to work hard to be successful. Yeah, we can be in the greatest nation on earth, but you still have to get up and go earn a living. The difference here is that we're allowed to pick what we want to do. You don't win any contest, you don't win any job, you don't win any relationship just by showing up. God provides the raw talent, but it's up to us to hammer that talent into something useful through practice, through work, through perseverance. Just because we have all these advantages in this nation doesn't take away from us the responsibility of trying, of working, of persevering. Another lesson I think that's closer to home, certainly for us as Christians, is this. We have to deal with our sins early. You know, Samson was impulsive, he was sexually impure, and it got, in, it got him into trouble, not just as a young person, but as an adult as well. We sometimes excuse sins because they're just little sins, or they're just things that maybe young people have problems with. The bad habits and attitudes that we develop while we are young will only get worse when we get older. You know, dealing with sin is always difficult whether you're young or old. And I'll tell you something, you always have to deal with sin. You always have to deal with sin. I remember when I was in college, I asked one of my professors there who was well into his 70s, close to 80 at the time, still teaching. And I asked him, does it get any easier when you're over 70 or if you're 75, does it get any easier dealing with sin? And he said, no. The only thing that changes are the sins. There's some sins that young people do, and as you grow older, they kind of sort of melt away anyways. But there's always sin to deal with. He said they just become a little more complex and a little more subtle, but they're still there and it's still a battle. The time to deal with sin in our lives is always right away no matter how old we are. You know, it's such a shame for a young and talented person with great potential to destroy his or her life, to destroy his or her chance at success because they refuse to deal with their sins at an, earlier, uh, an, an early time in their lives. What a tragedy, because we just do not want to deal with a particular issue when it comes up we try to hide it, we try to deny it, we try to repress it, we try to regress it, we try all these things. But eventually it comes out and it trips us up. Sometimes not right away, but sometimes a little farther down the line. So we need to learn to deal with our sins. We all have to do it, but the lesson of Samson teaches us that we should earlier is better than, than later. And then maybe one other lesson, very important, is that God will come to your rescue. God will come to your rescue. You know, again, Marty really enjoyed his lesson this morning. He, he was saying, God is always with you. He's always with you. How do you know? Because He's told you. 
I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. How, can it get any clearer? I think he said never. Never means never, doesn't it? And he says, I, God, will never, that means never, forsake you. Who's the you? Well, you, the believer. My child, never forsake you. Isn't that a comforting thing? I think most of us, for most of us, one of the great fears is to die, but not just to die, but to die alone. Why is it that people run? Oh, the doctor calls, well, you better come. You know, there's not a lot of time when people you know, in the middle of the night to get dressed. You know, and I remember when my mom passed, same idea. You got to call at two in the morning and she was maybe 30 miles away or getting dressed in the middle of the night. Wanted to be there for that moment. But the Bible tells us you're never alone. God is always with you. It's a promise. It's a great comfort. Well, another one of those great comforting ideas is that God will come to your rescue. You know, Samson learned the lesson that his people had learned centuries before. When you finally lose everything and cry out to God for help, He will rescue you. He will hear your call. Samson had lost his position, he lost his power, he lost his privileges, he had been reduced to being less than an ordinary man. Less than an ordinary man. A blind slave in prison. Doesn't get lower than that. But he overcame his pride and asked God to rescue him by using him again and God answered his call. And you know what? A lot of times we lose everything and the only thing we've got left is our pride. Isn't that a shame? We've got nothing left but we hang on to our pride and that's the very thing that stops us from calling out to God. You see, God isn't impressed by a person's talent or strength. He's impressed by a person's faith and humility and sense of need. We we're taught early on, it used to be men were taught early on, you got to stand up and you're a man, you got to get it up, you got to stand up, you got to you know, get up to the plate, you're a man and you know, it's on you. Men were taught not to need anything, but to depend on themselves, self-reliance. One of the secret bad things about the West is we've been taught self-reliance, which goes completely against our faith because our faith teaches us, no, no, we're supposed to be dependent on God completely. And now, sadly, in the 21st century, women are being taught that. You need to grow up where you don't need anyone, especially a man, but you don't need anyone and you can stand on your own two feet and you can just deal with people, men and women, on your own. Now women are being taught that lie. We're dependent on God for every single breath we take, for every single heartbeat. We're dependent on God. And so as I say, God is impressed or not impressed by our talent or strength. He gave it to us. He's impressed by our faith and our ability to humble ourselves and to show and express and acknowledge our great need of Him. This is what, it, it doesn't impress men. It doesn't impress humans. We're impressed by strong people, not needy people. But God is looking for those people who are honest enough to acknowledge to Him, look, I need you. I'm nothing without you. I can't go on without you. I, I don't want to go on without you. Those are the people he's looking for. And so I ask uh, as we uh, close out tonight's lesson, how, how are you using the talents and opportunities given to you by God? Because all of us here have been given a variety of talents and opportunities. Are you, here's a hard question, are you living up to your potential? And when I say potential, I'm not talking about are you making you know, 200,000 bucks or you have a million bucks in the bank. I'm not talking about that potential. I mean, are you living up to your spiritual potential? The reason God put you here to begin with, are you living up to that? Is the story of Samson a little bit like your own story? A great beginning, but because of self-indulgence and sin, not such a great end, not such a great result? Why not do tonight what Samson waited way too long to do? 
why not rededicate those talents that you have to God and ask Him to help you make a fresh start. And a fresh start means that you are consciously using all of your abilities and all of your opportunities to either give Him glory or to serve Him directly by sharing your faith. So if you need the prayers of the church to do that, or if you need to begin a brand new life as a Christian by being baptized tonight, if you need the prayers of the church in order to live up to the potential you know you have, but you have not yet reached, then we encourage you to come now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.